acquires most who requires nothing but commands respect. Erasmus, the education of a Christian prince. Welcome back. Let's continue analyzing Cervantes' greatest novel. At this point, Cidia Mete Berengeli intrudes for the second time in this chapter. This time, he complains about poverty. It's an amazing passage, and Amete's words are again problematic, ironic, and sophisticated. The Moorish author doesn't complain about the existence of poverty per se, but rather the weird tendency among Christians to embrace poverty itself as a virtue. In particular, he questions the logic of the great medieval Spanish poet Juan de Mena. Oh, poverty, poverty, I do not know the reason that great Cordoban poet was moved to call you sacred and unwelcome gift. Amete reveals that he is very familiar with Christian doctrine. Even though I am a Moor, I know very well, due to the company I have kept with Christians, that holiness consists of charity, humility, faith, obedience, and poverty. He even quotes Saint Paul. Nevertheless, Hamete distinguishes between spiritual and material poverty, and he argues that a puritanical obsession with the latter is unhealthy. But even with all that, I say that a man has to have an awful lot of God in him to be content with his poverty. But the heaviest irony comes when the Moor adopts the point of view of ethnocentric Spaniards. Why do you wish to crush the Hidalgos and the well-born more than other people? Then Benengeli makes a clear allusion to the portrait of the pathetic Hidalgo in El Lazario de Tormes. Miserable is the gentleman who goes about flashing signs of his honor while eating poorly and behind closed doors, playing the hypocrite behind the toothpick with which he ventures into the street after having eaten nothing that would oblige him to clean his teeth. The Moorish author's criticism of the cult of poverty now fuses with a mockery of the Spanish obsession with honor and public appearances. Amazingly, the narrator tells us that all the ideas of Berengeli here actually occurred to Don Quixote himself when he tore his stocking. Finally, we have Don Quixote's curious focus on a pair of high riding boots which Sancho has left behind. The knight finds consolation in Sancho's boots because they are just high enough to cover his stocking's new sign of his poverty. Remember this interest in footwear. Did you know Juan de Mena was a Spanish poet of the Dantesque allegorical school, recognized for his epic poem, Labyrinth of Fortune. 1444. Now Cervantes parodies the kind of love scene popularized by sentimental and chivalric novels as well as the Spanish ballad tradition. In the garden below Don Quixote's window, one of the Duchess's maidens, Altisidora, converses with her friend Emerencia. Their names are comical touches in yet another trick played on our night. The narrator tells us that Don Quixote embraces this new fantasy. In order to signal that he was there, he faked a sneeze. Altisidora complains of her unrequited love for this new Aeneas who has arrived in these parts only to humiliate me. In other words, Altisidora constructs an allegory in which Don Quixote is Aeneas and she is Dido. This mockery of Virgil is an anti-imperialistic gesture in Spanish literature that Cervantes inherits from Garcilaso. Note also, how the basic roles of the chivalric lovers have been inverted. Altisidora plays a harp and sings in the garden below while Don Quixote listens from his window. Altisidora's ballad is overwrought. As pathetic as the Spanish creeks, she says, mark the extent of Dulcinea's fame. Her praise for Don Quixote is absurd. The most valiant knight that La Mancha has ever produced, more chaste and blessed than fine Arabian gold. She comically compares her own suffering to that of Job. You inflict the words and denieth me the remedy that can heal them. And Mary Magdalene, I should like to rub your feet, for that's enough for this humble servant. She is envious of Dulcinea. Dulcinea does very well, a robust and healthy lass, to boast of having tamed a tigress 
and a fierce beast. Note how Don Quixote's gender has just changed and note the persistence of felines in Don Quixote part two. The market economy is also a topic as Altisidora says that she would give her best skirt to be like Dulcinea. I would even give a skirt bright with the finest trim. Race and ethnicity are topics as well when the maiden brags that her own complexion is somewhat on the brown side and confesses that she has been won over by the arrows of love in Don Quixote's very Arabic al-haba, or quiver. The most politically radical moment in Altisidora's ballad occurs when she says she would give Don Quixote la sola, a famous pearl owned by the Spanish Habsburgs, and then calls him Manchegan Nero of the world for having set her on fire. This juxtaposition does not flatter empire. Quixotic mission. With which woman does Altisidora compare herself in her ballad? A. Helen, Susanna, and Cleopatra. B. Lucretia, Esther, and Camilla. C. Dido, Mary Magdalene, and Dulcinea. Correct answer. C. Dido, Mary Magdalene, and Dulcinea. Don Quixote's reaction reveals his hilarious confidence in his own ability to attract so many women. Giving a great sigh, he said to himself, I have to be such an unfortunate knight errant that there is no damsel who does not fall in love with me at first sight. Lamenting that he is pursued by the likes of Altisidora and Maritornes, and with sexual overtones, he vows to maintain this my incomparable firmness. He expresses his loyalty to Dulcinea via an allusion to the windmill of part one. For Dulcinea alone, I am soft as dough and sugar paste, and for all the rest, I am made of flint. He then slams the window and goes to bed like a frustrated teenage girl. That's all for now. What do you think will happen next? Don't miss it. Don't miss out on the adventures of the ingenious gentleman Don Quixote de la Mancha. To enroll in the course, click on the novel. To subscribe to our YouTube channel, click on Don Quixote. To watch more videos, click on Dulcinea. And to follow us on our social media, click on Sancho Panza.